And hello, everyone. Everyone, so glad you're with us today on this Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evening, or whatever time you may be watching this. It's a great time to get into God's Word on Ask Me Anything. Hi, everyone. I'm Carlton Duck, pastor of Gethsemane Baptist Church. Welcome along. I see you popping up on the screen. We're so glad to have you today and hope you're doing well, having a great day, mightily blessed of the Lord. And again, uh, this is a great time to get together around God's Word and talk about some things that I pray will bless and encourage your heart. And we're really excited about what God's doing in this ministry through this particular program that we do each week on Wednesday afternoon at 5 p.m. And the neat thing about this is you can come back to it anytime and watch it again. Share it with your neighbors if you would, please. Uh, those of you who on Facebook and watching this, and uh, you watch it now, watch it later, please share, let your friends know about this and encourage them also because we are dealing with some pretty hot topics right now because Ask Me Anything Prophecy Related. Hi everybody, I'm Carlton Duck, pastor of Gethsemane Baptist Church here in Lynchburg. So glad that you're with us today. I'm excited about the opportunity to bring you this time in the Word that I pray will challenge your heart and uh, uplift you and encourage you. And we're on a very special part, and we will be the questions. We've got a bunch of them. And uh, so it'll take us a little time to get through all of them, and they're continually rolling in. And if you have a question prophecy-related, uh, please send that to us. You can do it, of course, on Messenger. You can send it to me by email. You can send it to me by text or however means, or just give it to me. Uh, if you see me and let me know about that question that we will include in the lineup of talking about Ask Me Anything Prophecy Related. Now, just before we jump in today to uh, a great group of questions that we have, I want to invite you to be a part of some things that God is doing in our ministry. I want to invite you first to our new website, and that's AliveGBC.com, A-L-I-V-E gbc.com. When you go to that, you'll get just a myriad of information, some great encouraging things that will, will, will bless you and your family. And uh, we try to keep that updated as, as much as we can. But also there's a couple other elements on there that's very beneficial to you. You can go to my Facebook page from that. Additionally, you can also go to our YouTube account and see videos. A great program, and I just recorded one today on Viewpoint. And that's a 30-minute program that is airing on a live TV along with our church programs. And we have them on that also. And you can watch that anytime and uh, watch it as often as you would like. So encourage your friends. That's another share element. So I need you to share what we're doing here today. I need you to share at Facebook, AliveGBC.com. And last, before we jump in today, uh, I want to encourage you to come and worship with us at Gethsemane. We are uh, meeting, of course, at 9.30 and 11.30 a.m. each Sunday, and it's a great time of worship. Uh, Brother Tom, who is our worship leader, does a superb job on putting together the music that's really centered around the message, and uh, we work to try to create that atmosphere of blessings for the, each one that attends here, and uh, we want you to come and be a part of what God's doing here. 9.30, 11.30 a.m. this Sunday, 411 Blue Ridge Street, and when I hard to find, one block off of Lakeside Drive near the main entrance to the University of Lynchburg. Additionally, uh, we have a great program for our kids on Sunday, and i got to really get into the camera and tell you, kids need to be a part of what's happening here at GBC because we have a great program called Kitty Care Kit. Kids Care Kit that each Sunday the kids get a kit. It's got all kinds of information. It's got Bible information. It's got study guides. It's got things for them to do. They can do it in the pew. They can take it home, and each week they get one, and it's just phenomenal. The kids absolutely love it, and you need to bring your children to GBC where everybody is important at Gethsemane Baptist Church. Come and worship with us. Come on, let's jump now into today the subjects that we're dealing with. I've got about five on the table that I'm going to try to get through, and if not, we'll just continue on next week. First question is this. Is the United States mentioned in Revelation? If not, what happens to this nation? This is a popular question that 
really uh, has a large percentage of Christians asking today. And let's see if I can address this issue and give you some direction on it. Again, thank you for being a part of this program each week. And thank you for being uh, in the midst of what God is doing in and through this church. First, thank the Lord that America stands with uh, in prayer uh, for Israel and that we, of course, are commanded by God's word. Remember the psalmist David said to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And, and then we, we realize what it said uh, that God spoke in, in Genesis 12. And uh, three, where he talks about, I will bless them that bless thee, that's Israel, and I will curse them that curse thee, speaking of Israel. We need to bless the nation of Israel. So realizing this, we are to pray for the people, we're to pray for the nation, we're to pray for the Jews. However, there's no guarantee that that will always be the case. As we well know, uh, different administrations here in our government in the United States have different views pertaining to Israel. As we saw during the eight years of uh, President Obama while he was in office, he and uh, Vice President Biden, they were not really friendly and were not supportive of the nation of Israel. Now, Christians really should take that into note uh, here, especially in the climate which we're in right now. The United States of America is never explicitly mentioned in the Bible. Israel, it really, if you look at it in the true context, that Israel is the main focus of Bible prophecy. When we understand why is the United States of America never been mentioned in prophecy? There, well, there could be several reasons for that. And, uh, and let's just look at them for a moment. First, perhaps the United States does not play an important role in end time events. Secondly, perhaps the United States does not exist anymore once the end times has began. Thirdly, perhaps the United States is included with all the other nations that have rejected God in the end times. That's found in Revelation 10, Revelation 11, Revelation 12, and Revelation 14. It could be that America will suddenly cease to be a world power and will therefore play no significant role in the end time events. The destruction of American power could be contributed to an economic catastrophe that will result from an out-of-control debt situation. And so therefore, we see that happening now. We just had the stimulus package that was done earlier this year. There's another one now that they're looking at, and of course in the House, that will be moved over to the Senate once they approve it. But there are trillions of dollars that are not going to understand going to the stimulus package for Americans. It's going to all these other things that has no pertinence and no bearing on that particular issue. It's not going to businesses. It's not going to individual Americans. So it's what it's doing. It's uh, continuing to accumulate more and more and more and more debt, which creates a problem. And so our God is the dollar, and the Lord is going to destroy that God with the weight of that debt collapse that will happen in the economy. So today, uh, just as a side note for you, if you're in debt, which I think about everybody is, you need to start working on getting yourself out of debt and get debt free. And there's some great programs out there. Dave Ramsey has some great programs about working your way out of debt. It's not an instantaneous program, but listen, you have to work at it. So avoid debt if you can. That was just a side note. Just this year, the national debt of America has grown beyond your imagination. Also, sin is more predominant than ever in America, as we well know. So keep in mind what Proverbs 14 and 34 says, Godliness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. That's a very important scripture. What once was freedom of religion seems to have now become freedom from religion. People don't want God. They don't want anything to do with the church. They don't want anything to do with the Bible. And you've seen all the issues that have gone on and people carrying signs and they don't want God. Well, listen, they're going to get what they want. One day they're going to get a nation without God. And let me tell you what, it's going to wreak havoc in this land. We have succeeded in getting God out of our schools, out of our sporting events. I mean, I don't even watch national sporting events. And just as a side note, you need to stop watching them too. Don't, don't endorse their products and don't endorse what they're doing. 
Listen, we, that's the best way to do that and to get to them is tighten the belt and don't support them. But we see that happening and out of our public places and out of our workplaces. I mean, we have really gotten to a place that we're almost asking what's next. Well, I don't want to get on the soapbox here. But with the economic collapse, then the problem with Russia could escalate and, of course, America could severely be attacked by the Russians in some type of a nuclear attack. Then there's one other possibility, and let me throw this one at you. There's another possible fate for the United States. If the rapture were to occur today, we would be devastated uh, because our nation contains more born-again Christians than any other nation in the world, more than all of Western Europe combined. So further, we have many born-again Christians in high positions uh, of commerce and government today, and the rapture could reduce that nation to chaos, removing us from the international scene as a world-dominant power. So whatever the case, I say this with regret. If America does not get to repentance, to repentance and revival, we're going to lose America to the pagan liberals today and the God-haters of our nation. I think it's time the church wakes up and starts proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ and start living what we say that we believe. And I believe you would have to say, Amen. All right, let's move along. That was a good one, wasn't it? Wow. Well, here's a good one. I've heard the Antichrist will come out of the East. What nation do you suppose that is? Could the Antichrist be American but living across seas? Well, this is a very good question that could employ speculation if we're not careful, but let's apply some spiritual evidence instead to get what God has to say about this. The location for the origins of the Antichrist is, the, is a debated topic today with Christians, and everyone is addressing this issue and trying to hone in on it. The popular belief teaches that he will rise either out of a, of a revived Roman Empire or even out of the United States. Now, wait just a moment here. There's a biblical reason why the Antichrist will not come from Europe or America, but instead will probably come from the Middle East. Let's take a closer look. Let's examine this a little bit further today. Psalm 2. It's amazing how you can go through God's Word and find application to the issues that we're facing today, and even futuristically speaking, too, that, uh, that God's Word today is explicitly clear on. Psalm 2, David reveals God's disdain towards national leaders, kings, dictators, presidents, prime ministers, and those who have gathered together to fight uh, each other in what we know as the Battle of Armageddon. The armies of the Antichrist, we realize uh, the 200 million soldiers of the East are set to engage in war when the Lord Jesus Christ returns in what we know as the second coming of Jesus. No, that's not the rapture coming. The rapture coming will be when Jesus appears, calls out the church, we go to be with the Lord, then seven years of tribulation will, of course, uh, envelop this earth. So when the, the enemies of the Antichrist, we realize, or the, the enemies of Christ, the Antichrist, will then engage in war. When they fight against him, he wipes them off of the face of the earth. You can read Revelation 19 and see the end result. So Psalm 2, David talks about or pictures a scene before the second coming of Jesus when all nations of the world will consolidate into a worldwide government lined up against God. And so what, not once in recorded history has the world been brought together in any sort of international unity. Now, here's something else that's uh, applicable to this. Uh, what we're going through currently with this pandemic, and there's many names associated with, of course, the coronavirus, and it may be the very forces that will foreshadow the rise of the Antichrist. Now, the coronavirus, I believe, is a culprit today. This pandemic that we're in has the attention of every world government. And, and they're working together in a common cause to fight against the danger, dangerous threat and to determine uh, some type of a serum that will combat against this, this deadly virus. So many governments have attempted global domination. You look back. 
Uh, they've all conquered great chunks of territory, but none of them ultimately uh, succeeded in being a world-dominant, world, one-world government uh, uh, producer. So many have tried to achieve one-world relations, uh, rulership, that is. So let me just give you a couple examples. One, Alexander the Great conquered uh, from Greece all the way to India, but he could not unite it into a one-world government. Further, August, uh, Augustus Caesar, he conquered the territory from Spain to France, to Italy, to England, to Rome, and to Turkey, but he could not put together a worldwide government. Then there was that tyrant Adolf Hitler that promised 1,000-year reign of the Third Reich, but it did not last. Then we realized there was Nikita Khrushchev. You remember Nikita Khrushchev who took off his shoe and I believe it was in the United Nations and he pounded it on the desk and emphasized that he would take over the world. Well, he didn't do it. And then at the end of World War II, and I'm giving you some history here, the United States was poised to rule the world. Many historians believe that Roosevelt and Churchill sold out Poland and Eastern Europe to the Soviet Union, placing Stalin in a position of global power. So the Bible says one man will rule, and that one man on this earth for seven years will be the Antichrist. But his rule will come to a ceasing halt. The Bible says that the horned goat that's in Daniel 8, the beast that is, that's found in Revelation 13 and Revelation 17, will do this very thing. The Antichrist will set up a one world government, but I believe he's going to find a lot of frustration because once he thinks he has his hands around the situation, God then sends another judgment to the earth. I tell you, we, we serve a mighty God. We serve a sovereign God. We serve a God that can do all things exceeding a above all that we could ever ask or think. And that's the power of our God today. He's got it all under control. Don't you worry about it. He's got it all under control. So therefore, today, we find the truth is that our world may actually be getting ready for this one world government. The pieces are falling into place. If you know anything prophetically about the Bible, Revelation 17 gives us some very interesting details about the kingdom of the Antichrist and the beast that appears in this chapter is the same beast that appears in chapter 13 and is thus the fourth kingdom that is found in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. However, chapter 17 also reveals some additional information for us and we realize that verse 9 teaches us that the seven heads on the beast, which of course uh, first make an appearance in Revelation 13, are seven kingdoms or seven kings. So by the time John was writing, now hang in there with me, by the time John was writing Revelation, five of them had fallen, genuinely, uh, generally believed to be Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persian, and Greece, and the sixth was currently in the existence, and that was Rome. So the seventh, however, was still in the future, and the beast itself was, an, was the eighth king or kingdom. Now, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 is the kingdom of the Antichrist, so it must come from after Greece, which is the fifth empire in the sequence uh, pro uh, provided by Revelation chapter 17. I would encourage you to read that. Since Rome is then the sixth head, but is not the place of origin for the Antichrist, then that must be the seventh kingdom, which will emerge at some point in history and, and decline and then be revived during the end of days. So the Islamic Caliphate fits these details once again. You check that out. The empire was founded after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. It existed for a, a dominant force from 632 to 750 AD. Afterwards, it would slowly weaken until uh, we see the condition of the Middle East today, basically as we find in the details of Daniel 2. So the Islamic Caliphate is the only empire to fulfill the requirement of Daniel 2, 7 and Revelation 13. So very possibly the Antichrist will come from the Mideast. Now, we've got a few moments left and we've still got a lot of ground to cover. I hope you're doing well and, and uh, I hope you're learning something today through this time of study. Is there any way, meaning the redeemed who come with Christ at his second coming, will be wounded in the battle of Armageddon. 
I've never had that question posed to me before, but it's an excellent question, and I appreciate you asking that. We believe in the second coming of Christ. We believe in the rapture coming of Christ. As a matter of fact, we believe in the entirety of the Bible. So his return from heaven will be personal, visible, and glorious, a blessed hope for which today we should constantly watch and pray for, and I believe that we're living in end times. The scriptures, you read it, you see the events. Something has got to happen, and I'm telling you, I believe the next thing to happen is we're going to leave this earth, and we're going to be with the Lord. So before he establishes his kingdom on earth, Jesus will come for his church, an event that we know as the rapture of the church that's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ. Of course, he tells us the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who alive and remain will be caught up in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. So, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, in this resurrection, we realize those who have died in Christ, they have been redeemed, and they will, of course, soul, spirit, uh, unite with bodies similar to the Christ glorified body. That's the rapture. When Christ, when the graves burst open and then the redeemed who are alive and remain will be called up together to meet the Lord in the air, we will receive a glorified body. So after the rapture of the church, Christians will be brought before the judgment seat of Christ. We know that, of course, as the beam of judgment. And he will reward them on the basis of their works in which they have accomplished for the kingdom of God from the point that they were saved. So this is not a judgment to determine their salvation, but a reward that for their labor in serving Christ. So the rapture will also inaugurate a period that the Bible characterizes as the great day of his wrath, the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. It all boils down to the tribulation. So this time of unprecedented difficulty will affect Israel and all nations and its purpose will be to prepare Israel for her Messiah. I'm telling you, friends, I have done depth study over the last 30 years on this period of time called the, the tribulation. And it's a place that you do not want to be at. I tell you, you better make sure that you know Christ as your personal Savior. Receive him into your heart. Oh, what a difference he'll make. At the end of the tribulation, Jesus Christ will return with the host of heaven. And, uh, and you can read that in Revelation 19, as well as the church to establish the messianic kingdom uh, on earth, known as the millennial reign of Christ, millennial meaning 1,000 years. And we shall rule and reign with him, as scripture says. So there you see the picture of events. No, uh, those coming with Christ at the second coming will not be wounded during the battle of Armageddon. It appears the battle will probably be over before it even starts. I mean, Christ, all he will have to say is drop dead, <laughs> and it will happen. So let me suggest that you read Revelation 19, and that capture the scene at the battle of Armageddon, and then what happens after that scene of what takes place. Let's see if we can squeeze in another one here. Will people have a chance to be saved during the tribulation? Excellent question. And the Bible answers that. First, let's let Scripture speak for itself. Salvation should never be something that is put off. And I, I pray each of you today are saved and know Christ. And if not, I pray you shall and you will. And if you have family that needs to be saved, now's the time to tell them about Jesus. Paul declared in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, he said, Behold, now is accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. This is not something the Spirit of God is dealing with you. You need to move and you need to receive Christ into your heart and your life. But the Bible clearly emphasizes to believe in Jesus today, to accept him into your heart and your life. The Bible presents many people coming in faith to Christ during the time of the seven-year tribulation described in the book of Revelation. I happen to believe myself that the primary of those who are saved during the tribulation will be of the Jews because if you'll look at it in the true context of what Revelation is written about and written to and how it pans out, you'll see that it primarily deals with the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And so therefore I believe that what he is doing he is trying to prepare them to receive him and many will receive him during that time. So if the rapture takes place prior to this tribulation, then many people will continue in their faith to Jesus during this time period. 
But while many of these new believers will be persecuted, those who receive Christ, because they will not take what is called the mark of the beast, and they will be killed for their faith. And, and the good news is that their salvation, the salvation that God offers to all people will be available. But I personally believe that the, that the period known as the tribulation, again, I really want to re-emphasize this, is for the Jews to finally recognize Messiah and to receive him. There, are, there will be 144,000 Jewish preachers, 12,000 from the, each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And you know what they will proclaim? They will proclaim John 14, 6, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto him except today by the way that he is provided. That's Christ. He is our provision. Listen, there's not one way for the Jews and another way for the Gentiles. There's only one way, and that way is Jesus. And if you don't come that way, you're going to get left behind. And therefore today, it's important today that we proclaim salvation to all people, Jews and Gentiles. Every person needs the Lord. Others suggest that those who reject Christ prior to the, uh, to the rapture will not be given another opportunity during, the, during and after the rapture. So, however, the Bible makes no clear statement regarding this issue. It appears most likely that those who had already heard the gospel message would be among those likely to embrace Jesus uh, after the rapture. Why? Why is that the case? The message would already be known, and the rapture will affirm the truth of the Bible's teaching. So the Bible, however, the Bible also teaches that most will believe and be persuaded by the lies of the Antichrist. Remember the mark of the beast that will be required and that they will have to worship the Antichrist as God. And, and so that being the case, and not to mention the devastation that will be on this earth during that time. You know, if we think it's been bad through the coronavirus, through this pandemic over the last few months that we've encountered this, and it has been, I'm not minimizing that. But I'm telling you, this is not even a scratch on the paint of the surface as to what it's going to be like during the seven years of tribulation on this earth. You read the Bible and tell, let me tell you, the, the seven seal judgments, the seven uh, thunders, the, the, the lightning and, and the things that God's going to do, the trumpet judgments that it's going to be proclaimed and then the, the bowl or the vile judgments, a total of 21 judgments, a set of each in sevens that will be poured out and water turning to blood and the sun darkened and things dying and all the things that we'll encounter. I don't have time to go into the depth of this, but I'm telling you, it's going to be catastrophic. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be horrendous. And people can't buy food. You can't go to McDonald's or Hardee's or any place else and, and, and all the things that we are doing today. Listen, you will have to take the mark of the beast to even put food on the table for your family. So what happens is I believe the people will take the mark of the beast in survival. And that's really what we've been in for the last eight, nine months. People trying to survive. Can you now take that and multiply it a million times over of what it's going to be like during the tribulation? I'm telling you, friend. I believe the people will take that mark rather than taking Jesus. In addition to eternal life, faith in Jesus, I want to encourage you to and offer forgiveness of your sins, and it gives you power for new life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. It also gives you a new pur purpose for living. Why would you want to wait? Why not now? Why not Jesus? Why not receive him as your personal Savior? Well, we didn't get to the last question. We've run out of time. But we'll pick up here. And this is a great question. I'll already give you the question. Will the unsaved hear the trumpet? that rapture believers will hear? That's an interesting question. Next week, we'll deal with that and a host of other questions. I could just give you short phrase answers, but I try to give you depth to give you an understanding of God's scripture so that you are better equipped 
as a Christian. Thank you today for being a part of Ask Me Anything. And don't forget, you can still get those questions in. I want to encourage you to please come be with us this Sunday. Listen, folks, Gethsemane is absolutely pumped, prime, and on fire for Christ. And it's a great place to be. It's an exciting worship service. One hour at 9.30, one hour at 11.30. Bring your family. We have a great program for kids in the pew called Kitty Care Program. It is Fabulous. Man, I wish I was a kid sometime and I could be uh, in that process of, of getting all those great things and getting those teachings that I'm getting through the care kit. It is phenomenal. Your kids will love it. And of course, we want to invite you to come and be a part of what's happening here at Gethsemane. 411 Blue Ridge Street, one block off of Lakeside Drive. We're near the main entrance to the University of Lynchburg. And additionally, our last point I want to draw your attention to is be sure to share this uh, program and share this at church and share this at new website, and that is AliveGBC.com, A-L-I-V-E-G-B-C.com. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you today for being a part of this study, and I pray your heart has been blessed. Send those questions, and may God bless you mightily, and we will hope to see you at the church where the shout has not gone out, that is Gethsemane Baptist Church. Bless you today. Thank you.